In this lecture, we are going to cover diseases of the gallbladder. The gallbladder is an organ that temporarily stores the bile that is originally synthesized in the liver. While it is in storage, the gallbladder actually concentrates the bile by removing water and electrolytes. Upon certain stimulation, like when we ingest food, especially foods rich in protein and fat, it will increase the risk of the hormone CCK or cholecystokinin. The elevated CCK level will trigger the contraction of the gallbladder, leading to the release of bile into the duodenum. The bile acids in the bile exist in the form of sodium and potassium salts. So these bile salts, as part of the bile, will be released into the small intestine. The composition of the gallbladder bile is mostly water, about 97%, and then just about under 1% bile salts. And then the rest is made up of bilirubin, fats such as cholesterol, fatty acids, and lecithin, and then finally inorganic salts as well. A common disease is gallstones in the gallbladder. Actually, they can be in the system of the bili biliary duct as we can see here. We know that the liver is the organ that synthesizes the bile and the liver sends the bile to the gall gallbladder for temporary storage. So from the liver to the gallbladder. So the gallstone could originate from inside the liver and travel along the duct as depicted here in the picture. It could get stuck anywhere in these structures. For example, it could get stuck here. And if that happens, obviously the liver will not be able to release the bile into the gallbladder, therefore pressure inside the liver would build up. If the gallstone travels further down and blocks, say, this site, then um, this will obviously be affecting more organs, so both the liver and the gallbladder. And also further down the duct, if the gallstone obstruction occurs at the common bile duct, down here, or uh, where the muscle control at the sphincter of Audi is, here, um, then the, this obstruction would not only affect the liver and the gallbladder. So we see that um, the pancreatic juices enter at the same sites, so therefore, it would also be backing up the flow from the pancreas and um, the pancreatic juice would not be able to get into the duodenum, so the pancreas would also be affected. And although we call it gallstones or cholelithiasis, this is something that can affect many adjacent organs. And in the case of a in, and in the case of acute pancreatitis caused by gallstone, it could have a systemic effect leading to multiple organ failure as we discussed in the previous lecture. So there are some terms associated with gallstones. One is biliary sludge. So the name indicates that this is not quite a liquid, but it's not stone yet. So we here we have some crystal material forming inside the gallbladder or the biliary duct. And then we have a condition called biliary stasis. So this basically means uh, the stalling of the biliary system. And this can also be seen in people with short bowel syndrome and who are on prolonged parental nutrition support. So if we think about it and you know, if we're dealing with someone with short bowel syndrome, this could lead to long-term use of PN 
And it, this is something that we should remember to check for. In terms of the composition of the gallstones, they uh, could be mainly made up of cholesterol. And if we look at the word here, coal, meaning bile, so this indicates something about the gallbladder or the biliary system. So we see up here, cholelithiasis. So we have coli, meaning gallbladder or biliary, and then lith here means stone. So this is a condition with gallstones. So back down here, gallstones can also be made of pigments or a mixture of both cholesterol and pigments. And then up here, we see some of the causes of gallstones. Um, it mentions absorbing too much water or bile acids from the bile, having too much cholesterol in the bile, or the inflammation of the tissue epithelium. The obstruction of the biliary system, as we meant, sounds similar. It is called cholecholithiasis. So we know that choli means it's gallbladder, and when we say cholecholithiasis, so cholecholithiasis, this means that the obstruction occurs um, here where the common buck common um, bile duct is so here this is kind of the head of the pancreas so if this here is the pancreatic duct then this would be the shape of the pancreas here kind of fits in here. And then this over here in anatomy is what we would call the head of the pancreas. So this is a comparatively more severe obstruction because it affects more than just the gallbladder. It also affects the liver and pancreas as well. And because the blockage is here, not only will we see maldigestion due to lack of pancreatic enzymes in the duodenum, but we will also not be receiving bile. Therefore, we will have inadequate emulsification of the fat and pigments from the bile because they will be blocked as well. As a result, the pigments from the liver will have to be excreted in the urine. So patients will have darker urine because of the pigments and bilirubin secreted in the urine. In contrast, their stools will become pale and grayish, kind of like clay because the normal disposal of biliary pigments is not possible. So this is something we can ask the patient. Have you noticed a change in the color of your stool recently? Then we have the most common inflammation of the gallbladder, uh, cholecystitis, and this is referring to inflammation of the gallbladder. Usually this is secondary to the obstruction of the flow of bile, or there may be a lack of blood flow if we have uh, ischemia. It can also be due to certain infections. So we do see infections in the biliary system. The next condition, cholangitis, is the inflammation of the biliary ducts. And this is usually secondary to obstruction of the common bile duct. So the common portion of the duct used by both the pancreatic juice and the bile that flows to the small intestine. People with gallstones will usually ex experience indigestion and decreased ability to digest, which we've mentioned and it could be caused by the blockage of the pancreatic juice or bile flow or both. So if we are missing 
some major players in digestion here. We're either missing an important emulsifier, emulsifier in bile, or we are missing both the bile and pancreatic juice, which contains the majority of the enzymes needed for normal digestion. These undigested nutrients will move through the small intestine and reach the colon where they will then be fermented by the colon bacteria. Therefore, it is very common for patients to complain about um, abnormally high gas production. Diarrhea is also common, especially for people who have had surgery. And when we assess people with gallstones, we have to check weight and weight history and conduct the routine 24-hour recall. And if a patient has an infection and or they are on NPO, we should check the albumin and the prealbumin level because we want to see how these factors are impacting the patient. We also need to know any medications taken by the patients. So these medications could be targeting the gallstone itself or managing the symptoms. For example, when the pain becomes unbearable, the doctors may give the patient painkillers. We know that some of the side effects of painkillers include decreased GI motility, among other things. So we may see a nutrient medication interaction as a side effect of these medications. Therefore, we should be sure to ask about and note these. Commonly used problems for the diagnosis statement include inadequate oral intake or maybe excessive oral intake in certain cases. As we will discuss, it is not the more the merrier when the patient begins to resume PO intake. There is a balance that needs to be achieved. Altered GI function, this one is pretty easy to understand. And of course, we already mentioned food medication interaction. Usually people with gallstones should consume lo a low fat diet with modest protein. Intake should be broken up into small frequent meals. If they are experiencing acute attacks with very severe pain and other symptoms, usually they will be put on NPO to minimize the stimulation of the contraction of the gallbladder. So since there is a blockage, the more we try to release bile, the more congestion will happen so the symptoms could get worse. And by putting on people on NPO, we're hoping to avoid this. Also, for people who have, ha who have diarrhea after surgery, we usually manage this with a high fiber intake, and at the same time, the patient needs to be paying attention to what foods could trigger diarrhea so that they can be avoided. Then, of course, we want to advance the diet as tolerated. And to monitor and evaluate, mainly we should be checking the tolerance of the diet and also the patient's compliance of the dietary recommendations.